Hello everybody, I'm uh, here today, finally. Last week I was uh, unable to record a video just due to time constraints, so um, sorry for that. But uh, today I want to talk about contemporary social issues, strengths in Native American tribal communities. And I really want to look at three aspects of, of, of this. And this is just the beginning of our last stretch of class discussions. We have a couple more to go. I think two or three more. So I really want to look at the good, the bad, and the future. So I don't want to focus necessarily on bad because social issues and strengths are not necessarily all bad. But no matter what it is, if it's good or if it's bad, it's still the future. So we have to kind of talk it, shape it, see where it's going to go. Because there are many uh, issues that are affecting Native communities today that uh, you know, have have an effect, and have had an effect on the future. Whether it was a long time ago, because anybody's future is uh, ahead of them. So, 100 years ago, people's future was 100 years behind us. So, it's still the future. So, we're looking forward. We're looking into that process. And uh, what I really would like to do today is kind of focus a little bit on a couple topics. But we'll we'll address a bunch of topics. So, what are the topics? <clears throat> well, these are the topics that I've identified that I will be looking at. Some of these we kind of we kind of uh, skimmed as we went through some of the other lessons and readings. So here's uh, the topics, and there's no in no particular order. So I'm going to talk about about them, and these are the ones that our communities face. These are not necessarily ones that just Indian communities face, but we're going to talk about the native communities and what they face. So we're talking sickness and disease. We're talking about professional and local school mascots. I touched on that earlier. Native gangs on reservations. This is something that we really don't look at or realize or understand or even wonder what it's all about. But we'll look at that a little bit deeper, native gangs. And uh, posing as a Native American for gain so there's a, actually a law in the state of Maine that says you, if you're not a member of a federally recognized tribe and you go out and market yourself as a Native American descendant or uh, an expert or whatever, so you represent yourself as a Native American for gain, whether it's for attention, whether it's for media attention or self-attention or whether it's for money or both, whatever it may be. It's a law against that. There's actually a national law against it. And uh, there's a main state law against it. We'll talk about that a little bit deeper as well. Also, there's a Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act called NAGPRA. And uh, the Graves Protection and Repatriation Act really is something that's finally happening that uh, has been happening in Canada for a while, but now it's come over to the United States probably about 15, 20 years ago here, and uh, it protects Native American graves from being exploited, so you can't just go dig them up and take this, the artifacts out and disseminate them, sell them, or show them in a public way. And repatriation means to uh, rebury the bones that were dug up and put in boxes and studied. So uh, it's illegal, and it has been illegal, and uh, you know, just general graveyards, you just don't go do that. But in Native American graveyards, for some reason, people did it and uh, financially benefited from it or disrupted the graves, which is a desecration, really, if you think about it. Anybody whose grave is dug up, it's a desecration. So this gives us protection against that. Then we're going to talk about residential schools. We kind of touched on that. We're going to do a closer look on that as well. <laughs> And uh, we'll, we'll look at it on a national level as far as Canada and the United States. We'll also look at it and how it affected Maine Indian tribes. And again, Maine Indian tribes were not relocated. We're not relocated tribes. So it had an effect on us, but not as much as it did on the, on the western, southwestern uh, states or even in Canada. Elder abuse, and that's just well, what it sounds like whether it's financially exploiting an elder or physically abusing or neglecting an elder. Uh, 
that's something we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, there's an article we're not going to really get into today, but it's called The Secret War on Dissent, and it's about the FBI and how the FBI suppresses, you know, dissent uh, among Native people and Native tribes, and there's a specific case we're going to be looking at, and I probably will be putting that up as an attachment in the folder whatever week we end up doing this because as we're going down through these we're not doing these all today this is going to be what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks into the last part of the semester um, sterilization of women which was very common if a woman was having a baby it was a federal mandate that if a woman was having a baby a native woman on a reservation or out, outside of a reservation in a hospital that um, she was to be sterilized as uh, after the baby was born and uh, that would <coughs> uh, essentially that's a genocidal tactic but it was very well documented and and it was part of uh, a medical practice so that the women couldn't have babies anymore and that would stop the uh, bloodline of the uh, native people in that particular area that this happened and uh, it happened everywhere but in other parts hit more but I guess within the, each individual woman it's still it's a hundred percent relevant and there's a lot of women that are still alive today that can't have babies because of this tactic that took place back in the days and we're also gonna be talking about the urban Indian so this is a little bit different than the rural Indian so the rural Indian would be the one that lives on the reservations urban Indians are non reservation based so they live in cities towns they live uh, they choose to live in those places and uh, we'll talk a little bit about them and their struggles and what they have to go through all right so here we go I want to start out with this in sickness and in health and health is spelt wrong but but bear with me <laughs> just notice that okay so in sickness and in heath but it's supposed to be health so 2,000 years ago <laughs> 2,000 years before Christ so it would be 3,014 years ago we would say here eat this root that's how we would basically you know heal something 1,000 AD that root is heathen here say this prayer so we're looking at physical healing here 1850 AD that prayer is superstition here drink this potion 1940 AD, that potion is snake oil. Here, swallow this pill. 1985, that pill is ineffective. Here, take this antibiotic. Around 2010, we say that antibiotic is artificial. Here, eat this root. And this particular slide comes from a, a doctor at, at Columbia University who uh, teaches history of medicine. And I came across this slide and I thought it it's really an, it's really appropriate in that it really looks at how we look at things you know we have these health food stores now and we talk it we talk now a lot about alternative healing and in fact in some arenas it's actually paid for by insurances if you choose to go with alternative healing so in that respect we you know we start out with a plant thousands of years ago we go through all these different sort of uh, levels of, of, of artificial health care and we go back to eating or taking medicines that have come from the land to heal ourselves so this is this is a real <coughs> sort of poignant statement about the history of medicine and how native people have always had this as well and this is obviously applicable to a lot of different cultures in fact it was recently written so I uh, want to share this because it's poignant. Now we're going to spend a couple slides, maybe two or three slides here on, on the diseases. One of the diseases we forget about is a disease called dysphoria. Well, it's not really a disease. It's uh, literally meaning the scattering of life. Dysphoria is an infectious disease which is able to disperse worldwide through the movements of international travelers. The specific example I want to focus on is Pemaquid, Maine, has had an outbreak in 1617 and in, again, 19, uh, 1620. 
and uh, these were caused by bacteria that grows in the ballast of a ship which was inadvertently transferred by cleaning of the ballast so in other words what we're doing here is I, I want to kind of uh, differentiate between the great dying the, where a lot of people got sick which happened later on it's called smallpox and smallpox was uh, was a was a disease that was just absolutely cognitively spread throughout the land. You know, people knew they were doing it. It was well documented. Even though some people will dispute that documentation, it's well documented, and um, it's in people's handwritings. So we'll look at that. But let's let's go back to this dysphoria for a second, and that is that is that this is something that killed a lot of people, but not just native people. Basically, people that were living in this land, and if you're not familiar with the Pemaquid area, South Bristol, Bristol, Walderboro, uh, Damariscotta, all those areas, is, that's the area I'm talking about in Maine, which is south of Rockland. So these particular areas had these outbreaks where they had a lot of people that were dying from this. And it was something that actually came about because when these sailing ships bringing trade items came across the ocean they would come across and they would um, need to be cleaned because everything that's in the ship you know whether it's water whether it's you know uh, spilt drink whatever it may be ends up in the ballast of the ship and obviously the ballast is the bottom of the ship that keeps the uh, weight evenly dispersed so the ship sails uh, you know right in the water and uh, if the waves start rocking the ship to the left or right the ballast kind of brings it back to the middle and the ballast on these ships was was basically uh, rocks and these rocks were covered with boards and that was the ballast and every once in a while they'd have to be cleaned so what they would do is in order to clean them to keep diseases from breeding in the ship, especially when you're out to sea for a while, with no chance of being able to do this. You can't clean the ballast, obviously, when you're sailing because you're going to tip. So they would bring the ships onto the shore sideways. They would kind of sail them sideways, let's say to a beach. And then the tide would go out and the ship would be completely laying on the land because it's low tide. You have four hours to clean those ballasts. And so what they used to do is they used to hire, these shipping companies would hire people that were very poor, that would do anything for money. And they would hand out these rocks one by one, make a line. And they'd take all the rocks out of the boat. They'd clean them. They'd clean the inside of the hull. Now they're only doing one side. And the next day they would rotate the ship, face it the other way, let the tide go out and then they would do the other side of the ship. But what this would do is this would uh, clean the bottom of the ship. Basically get all the bacteria, all the nastiness, the grossness that kind of accumulates in dark places on rocks that are damp, which if you can imagine it would be a very very disgusting sort of thing to do because like I said any fluids any rot, any decay from anything above on the ship would end up in there. It would actually flow down in. So uh, what this would do is this would this would uh, this was nastiness. This was something that people would uh, get these bacteria, you know, in their eyes and in their mouths, and weaker immune systems, poor people would die. They'd die from it, and that was too bad but it really affected because what would happen is it could go from one person to another person through body contact, fluids, and stuff like that. So dysphoria was the first real big wide sweeping sort of illness that came through this area. And people really didn't know why, obviously. They didn't have the science. I mean, they probably figured it out, but they didn't have the science to say, well, this is what we did, this is how it happened, and this is what we gotta do next time because desperate people will do anything to earn money for or food for their families. 
so this was a, a huge outbreak, but it was not smallpox. But smallpox did exist during this time in this area, but it had little effect in causing a number of deaths in the area, in New England area. So we'll talk about the uh, devastation of smallpox. And here, this slide is uh, going to show us basically the culture. So we're looking at, on the left hand side, we're looking at the actual tribes. And again, I'm looking at New England, obviously, Abor Aboriginal cultures in New England. And <clears throat> then we have the pre epidemic population, the post epidemic population, and the mortality. So I put this slide in here because it actually tells us. And, and it's based on estimates. It's not based on any facts. It's not based on any uh, solid figures. You can see everything's rounded up. It's nothing is rounded down as far as, I mean, it's all rounded up to the hundredth. So the Malisey, say Malisey Passamaquoddy area, that these, whoever was documenting this, thought there was about 7,600 people living there. Eastern and Western Abenaki, 11,900 and 10,000 respectively. The Massachusetts tribes, tribe 36,700 and so forth and smallpox was uh, introduced and we have a remainder what the population was after and we look at the Maliseet and the Passamaquoddy with 2500 from 7600 that's a mortality rate of 67 percent of that population was uh, killed by smallpox. Significant number. 75% of Eastern Abenaki, 98% of the Western Abenaki estimated to be killed by smallpox. 98% absolutely wiped out that community. These mortality rates are the ones that are important. 86%, 77, 95, 95, 91, 55, the Mohawk were the least hit. There were more inland but 55% of your population, that's uh, over half of the people around you. So it's still significant. And the Munsee, 81 to 91%. Again, these are all estimates. But the mortality rate here is what's significant. And because it's significant, it really shows the devastation and leads us to look at an extermination, a genocidal, one of the genocidal efforts that was made over here that uh, was a very cognizant Holocaust attempt to rid New England of native people. And it really, really knocked down a lot of people, women, children. Oh, it has, this disease has no filter. It's going to take whoever, whatever, it wants. And smallpox is a hideous, disgusting disease. I didn't put any pictures up on this particular slide of what smallpox looks like on the skid, but if you, you, you know, want to look it up, it's um, prepare yourself for almost looking at something that's non-human. It really has that much of an effect on your physical appearance. So let's, let's talk a little bit about Lord Jeffrey Amherst. Now, if you're familiar with Amherst, Massachusetts, this is who uh, who it's named after. Actually, he named it himself. He actually uh, changed the name because he was he was uh, able to do that. And here is some of the stuff that that took place within the smallpox blankets, which blankets that were delivered to p tribal people and handkerchiefs by Lord Jeffrey Amherst's command. So despite his fame, Jeffrey Amherst's name became tarnished by stories of smallpox infested blankets used as germ warfare against American Indians. These stories are reported, for example, in Carlton Walden's Atlas of North American Indian. Waldman writes in, refer in reference to siege of Fort Pitt by Chief Pontiac's forces during the summer of 1763, says this, Captain Simon had bought time by sending small pox infested blankets and handkerchiefs to the Indians surrounding the fort, an early example of biological warfare, which started an epidemic among them. 
Amherst himself had encouraged this tactic in a letter to uh, you, sir. So, this come out of a book, I'm taking these quotes out. Some people have doubted these stories, other people believing the stories, nevertheless assert that the infected blankets were not intentionally distributed to the Indians, or that Lord Jeff himself is not to blame for the germ warfare tactic. However, there is so much documentation in his own hand that is available that actually came from England because Lord Geoffrey Amherst was a, a British uh, general and so most of these documents were kept in in Britain and not over here on the American side and so we're looking at the mid 1700s on this and uh, he was very proud of it he, he wrote a lot of it and document a lot of it and the letters went back and forth to different generals different captains different um, different military leaders in in a way that that basically had every single description of what was happening how originally there's documentation about how uh, Jeffrey Amherst and uh, one of his his uh, other guys, Boquette, uh, who was also a general, but I think on the other side of the ocean, they wanted to rid this land, New England, of native people by use of dogs. So have dogs just go in and kill, kill, kill. You know, wild, wild, uh, trained dogs that would just rip apart people and kill people without, you know, any reason really, e even their own people. So <laughs> it was. Uh, it was a tactic that was deemed to be not really that effective because of the, um, the the way in which the landscape was set up, the the natural landscape. So it didn't work very well. So I'm not going to dwell on it too long here, but um, I just want to show you. So this this is a plate out of uh, a, a Lord Jeffrey Amherst collection, and he had these plates made. And this is just one example where you have a British military person on top of a horse swinging some kind of device and you can see these native people running for their life. And he was really proud of this. He was really proud, so proud of, of what he had done that he made these plates to show as he was eating or he'd have guests come to his house to eat that as they were eating and you're looking down you're actually seeing his legacy and I think these plates are held at the uh, Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts <clears throat> and these are the least offensive <laughs> uh, of the plates and but it, they, it's the only one I could find and again these were made in sets and you can see they're hand painted hand drawn but uh, they come out of his personal collection, and this is what he used. I mean, he liked to say, you know, I got my, my fortune and my city town named after me because this is what I did. That's him on the horse, by the way, with his sword. Okay, just a student in the class sent me this picture. I thought this was pretty poignant. This was a picture from this year, opening day at the Cleveland Indians home game and there were some Native American protesters there obviously you can see a guy on the on the uh, right hand side left hand side I'm sorry <clears throat> that's a native guy and then there's a guy who's dressed like an authentic Indian because that's how everybody dresses on the right not really but this guy in this headdress with his painted face is um, speaking with this, to this native guy on the left and and the thing is that interesting is that uh, there was also some dialogue with it but I didn't put the dialogue in but essentially what the, the the man on the left was hearing from the man on the right was the man on the right said this is honoring you I am honoring you this is what it is I'm honoring you and he tried to shake the Native American guy's hand and the Indian guy wouldn't put his hand out he just, you know, this whole 
idea of, you know, this is honoring you. That was the thing that this guy on the right kept saying over and over and over. I'm honoring you. You know, you need to understand that. You need to accept that. And it's this paternalistic sort of attitude. And this native guy kind of looking at this, um, you know, funkily dressed guy on the right kind of gives him the look like, uh, dude, serious, seriously. This is, you know, really, you painted your face red. Painted his face red. And look at the people in the background, all taking pictures of this. You think they know something's going on? They're probably Cleveland Indians fans. My guess would be they are Cleveland Indians fans. But look at them. They look like fans, not fanatics. That's how you go to a game. You enjoy a game like that. But this guy saying, this is honoring you, wasn't asking. He was telling. So let's 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 move to uh, to native gangs, loss of identity. Now, <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit of story here. Uh, you can l read these. We'll go down through them as we go here. But I want to tell you a story about um, a little bit of work I've done on reservations in, in the United States and in Canada with uh, native gangs. Because when I was in undergrad school, I really I was trained in uh, sort of working in, with gang members and trying to help gang members who identified themselves as wanting to give up being in a gang. So if we had two, three, or four people that wanted to request us, and there was two guys from the Northeast, uh, one Clint Shenandoah on Indaga from near about maybe 15 miles south of Syracuse at the Onondaga Nation, Iroquois, and myself from the Wabanaki Confederation on Indian Island uh, where I grew up, we were chosen and trained in how to talk with, with these people because they were our age at the time. They're probably still our age if they're still alive. We went down to different places. We, were, we found ourselves in Miami. We found ourselves in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Fresno, California, Oneida, Ontario, um, Billings, Montana. I, you know, just a few, there was there was about a dozen places that we we went to and did this, and we would do a one week sort of workshop with uh, these these um, these people who decided they wanted to give up being in gangs. But it was really hard because giving up being in gangs basically means you're a target. But most of these young men and women were not even caring. Like, if I'm a target, I'm a target. I'm getting out of it because it's not doing me any good. It's survival day by day. It's just not the way you should live. So we went down, and I'll just tell you this one story about, we went to Phoenix. And we were in Phoenix, and there's a lot of uh, Mexican sort of gangs, people there. Um, and uh, there were Native American gangs, black gangs, white gangs, corner gangs, you know, block, city block gangs. You know, it was just, it was nuts. It was just crazy. And we had about six people that wanted to get out of these gangs and, and wanted to get out of Phoenix. But they, they, it was like a, this, this one week thing is like an intervention. And uh, we also had psychologists with us and there was a, probably a team of about six of us, but we were, Clint and myself, were the two that were their age, and we would help talk to them about what it is that, you know, wh why did you get involved in the gang to begin with? Because we got to undo this. And it would always be like, well, I needed an identity. I need an identity. It makes me feel like I'm with somebody. It gives me a brotherhood, a sisterhood. It's, uh, it's, they protect me. But the thing about that is that these Native people didn't realize they have an identity. They have clan systems. They have family colors. They have clan colors. They have all kinds of ceremonies. They have brotherhood and sisterhood among each other in their traditional sense and in their contemporary sense. They don't need to be involved in gangs. So this one kid that was probably about 14 years old, a boy, 
and <clears throat> little guy and he was there and he was telling that um, us that he was going to uh, move out of Phoenix and go to uh, I think it was um, somewhere in New Mexico anyway with an aunt and because his mother and father were in jail and they were going to be in jail for 10 or 15 years so we said well you know your mother and father are in jail probably for 10 or 15 years he goes yeah so I'm gonna be in my 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 20s when when they get out so I have to go to high school somewhere and he said I don't even know how to read I don't know how to do any of this stuff he said I and I, I gotta go to high school he'd never been to school in his life and so his story was this when his mother and father had him and he could finally learn to walk so he was around you know obviously when babies walk and then he got to be around four years old he said and when he rem that's how we, we develop our first memories he said from the time he was about four years old to the time he was about 10 or 11 his only job in his life was he was awake all night sleeping all day just as his parents were because what they would do is they would go break into houses at night when people were sleeping people that were living in the houses they were in the house they would break in they would put him through the window it would be his responsibility to go find the front door or back door and unlock it and let the parents in and then he was unlocking the door and he would go to the car where it was hidden and he'd go in the back seat and, and fall asleep his parents would come out later on with stuff put it in the trunk and then off to the next adventure he said they'd do this two three times a night for his entire life they would go to pawn shops and sell the stuff they would you know have cash or whatever but it was all to support their drug habit and to pay some dues within their gangs they all had dues to pay as well whether it was through money or whether it was through objects or drugs whatever it may be they had to do it and so he had never been to school there was no record of him even being uh, you know being registered for his school so he said he'd watch TV all the time and and he would just sit in the back of the car and listen to music so this was his life and he wanted out so when we talk about native gangs there's re, re research in this area that determine the factors of youth identity and tribal acculturation and I'm gonna look at the Navajo Nation in this one and I think because this is the example I could I could really define it's where the study that was done and that's the reason why I use this I don't want to be speculative in, in what I'm talking about but socioeconomic issues of poverty alcoholism and family dysfunction help lead people to these gangs if you have no money and you are completely relying on your tribe or the government to bring in food or some sort of food assistance you really you really become depressed and depression can lead to a lot of things it can lead to alcoholism it can obviously alcoholism is family dysfunction other things too are different kinds of abuses that happen within families and extended families as well and because of this you get the loss of traditional culture by persistent kinship ties among cousins now persisting kinship ties among cousins cousins in most native tribes if you grow up on a reservation your cousins are like your brothers and sisters and in fact you even consider people that are not blood related to you cousins so you basically you start losing your traditional culture do are we gonna hold on to our traditional culture forever and native people gonna yes but are we gonna hold on to that in daily life no because our lives change I don't have any intention of going to live in a, a wigwam and be out hunting and fishing all the time to uh, to feed me or my family so we are gonna lose some cultural aspects everybody changes language changes things move on but forgetting who you are is nothing that's gonna happen among native people that's never gonna happen we're never gonna forget who we are we're always gonna have that traditional cultural knowledge we might not be able to practice that every day we might not want to we might not know how to but this is again 
leads to loss of identity. Also, alienated youth who strongly related to certain st strains of youth culture, especially gangsta identity, because <clears throat> um, this this whole idea of you know being a gangster, being feared, people look at you and they're like, "Whoa, I don't want to go near this tough guy." You know, I could my life could be in in danger. Uh, I better give them what they want if they ask me for something. Uh, it just that that whole idea becomes self-important, and and it, it creates this real, real uh, strange culture of um, some some sort of hierarchy. Now within that gangster identity, there is levels of gangsterness. So you got you know your lower ones, your middle ones, and your higher ones, and the guys at the higher level. You know, we picture in our minds, based on media, based on what we hear, if you haven't been involved in a gang, is that these are the guys that sit around, play cards, smoke cigars, you know, and talk, and then everything from the lower uh, levels of the gangster society are brought to them. So they're taken care of. But again, in the end, they're susceptible if they're not taking care of their people. These leaders are susceptible to uh, harm physical harm which would remove them from their position. Also high rates of geographic mobility of Navajo families between the reservations and metropolitan areas and so you got basically they're moving around back and forth back and forth so they bring in different aspects of the metropolitan sort of gang uh, attitudes back into the reservations so they're moving constantly and shift in reservation housing configurations that run counter to, to traditional settlement patterns and uh, this is basically stagnating people and that uh, when you stagnate somebody you build a street out in the middle of the desert and you put people in those houses and these people don't have cars because they don't have money and the closest towns 20 miles away there's no opportunity zero opportunity for any economic you know gain within this community and those who do economically gain won't live in these communities. So if somebody does break out of it, somebody else will move into that house. And it's a continued sort of um, pattern of, of um, dysfunction. I'm going to play this little video here. I just want you to watch it. I think it's, I think it's let's see. I'm not sure how long it is, but I'll let you watch this and just listen to this. It's a little interview uh, from some people who are involved in gangs. And it's a docu part of a documentary. Traditional drum circles like this strike a powerful heartbeat throughout Indian country. But on some reservations, native youth are adopting a different rhythm. Coming up a young G, another native kid, not giving a f talking about the crazy sh I did. I ain't gonna lie, I come from a broken home. I'm a straight rider, leave you with a broken doom. Taking killer hits to the blood. This is the Pine Ridge Sioux Reservation, South Dakota, one of the poorest places in the country and it's increasingly plagued by gangs who imitate urban groups like the Crips and Bloods. I'm 33rd, Northside Trey Trey, Gangsta Crip, you know? 33rd, you know? 24-year-old Richard Wilson has already carried five of his fellow gang members to the grave because of drugs, suicide, and gang violence. Yeah, this is where our Lakota, you know, Lakota people came from, you know, just right around here. I've been up on a reservation all my life, you know? A lot of people say it's, um, like, trash, you know? But to me, it's just like, you know, living in a ghetto, you know? I mean, I mean, it's just like living in the city, you know? People fighting each other, you're shooting each other, you know? Someone's getting beat up every other night. This is my brother. I just turned 24, man, so this is my, me and my brother. He and his 18-year-old half-brother, Richard Lame, are two of an estimated 5,000 youths involved with gangs on the Pine Ridge Reservation. That's one of every 10 people. Yeah, we had uh, the Wild Boys, TBZ, we had Trey Trays, we had Nomads, A-Town, Eastern Side, you know, Indian Mafia, Amster Gangsters, you know, I could go on, I mean. This is John Musso, 
He served as a local police officer for 14 years before becoming chair of the Tribal Judiciary Committee. He says that the number of gangs proliferated in the 1990s when money for tribal law enforcement dropped. But recently, violence is increasing. In recent years, there's been uh, some homicides, which is kind of uh, just don't happen in small communities. So assaults against police officers, against people that's not gang related, it, it, it continued to rise and a lot of intimidation. So it, it started affecting our, 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 the whole public. Many native gangs are homegrown, with few, if any, ties to the large urban gangs they take their names and style from. So we got our gang members, they, they burn their arms, so like branding, so they burn them. And the difference between our gangs and big city gangs are, in the cities, they're territorial. You know, they, they claim a neighborhood, and when they sell drugs, it's for profit for the gang. There are one or two people profit, and they show a large sum of money. It's not like that here because we're an impoverished people, impoverished land. So it's more, they're fighting over scraps. They're not fighting over money. I got at least 30, 30 homeboys rolling with me. That's Richard Lame. Unlike most, he stayed in school, but he's also a member of the Black Wall Street Boys. I don't know, I do it for, for I don't know, for the joy of it, for the fun, I don't know, for the rush, for the thrill, I guess, whatever it is. You get money, that's what, through, through selling things or through yeah, stealing things? Yeah, selling things, things stealing, robbing, whatever we got to do to get money. With theft and violent crime on the rise, Pine Ridge officials have pled for more funds to bolster law enforcement. And as on other reservations facing gang problems, tribal members here, like Michael Littleboy, are fighting gangs on the cultural front, teaching Lakota language and values. It's like a prayer song, and it's asking uh, for like forgiveness and strength. The gang, right out the door, it's always there, you know, and uh, no matter what, we fight with the spirituality, the singing and dancing and everything, we use that to uh, prevent um, young children from uh, gang violence and uh, uh, different things that come and go on on the reservation. We got a lot of absent parentism. They may be absent because through of uh, drug abuse, through alcohol abuse. They need to belong somewhere. And just like any other place, that gang gives them that false sense of belonging. Today, Rich Wilson says he's not as active in gangs as he used to be. Ever since birth, I've been waiting for death. So you can bet I'm going to be thug to my last breath. Gangs and despite his negative lyrics, Richard Lame privately says he wants to leave Pine Ridge and find a profession. Music or computer work, mechanics or something, anything I'm good at, whatever. It's my future ahead anyway. Hopefully it's a good, bright one. Aren't you worried that you might get a criminal record that'll prevent that? Maybe if I keep doing the stuff I'm doing, yeah. Mess up, slip up, sit behind bars, I don't know. Yeah, gotta get my, my, my mind right, my thoughts straight. Gotta get on top, somehow. So this is an example of, you know, from their own mouths. So these are the st states that have the most active gang areas, I guess, um, that have been identified by the um, FBI, tribal, with the help of tribal um, law enforcement and also the uh, federal Indian marshals. And that is um, in no particular order, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota. And when you look at this, this is how it comes up, is that, um, again, these are the two biggest, the Indian Posse and the Native Syndicate, and they span into, they actually originate from Canada, but they span into the United States as well. So the Indian Posse, they estimate around 12,000 members based in Winnipeg, Canada, and the Native Syndicate, they estimate around 800 members based in northern Manitoba and Canada. And these are all drug-related sort of gangs that actually do profit from the sale of drugs, uh, at least at the highest level, the lower level of the, the worker bees that, that just go out and do this stuff. They're, they're probably taken care of. They, they're, they're not making any profit, but they're being taken care of. So these are the two biggest identified gangs, and 
it's kind of weird that one comes out of Winnipeg and the other one comes out of Manitoba, Canada, but this is what it is, and this is the um, hierarchy of that. <coughs> and last, I think this is our last topic for this class, is the idea of making false claims. So there is a law in the state of Maine, and the law is is the uh, is called LD one five nine five, and it was passed by the House of Representatives in January of two thousand twelve, and this was put out because of a topic we'll talk about on the next slide. But well, let's talk about this one. So it's an act to impose a penalty for making false claims regarding affiliation with a federally recognized tribe. Be it enacted by the people of the state of Maine as follows. Section 1, blah, blah, is enacted to read. Fraudulent claim of affiliation with a federally recognized tribe. A person is guilty of fraudulent claim of affiliation with a federally recognized tribe if a person, A, knowingly claims falsely to be affiliated with a federally recognized tribe has the intent to obtain by making claim under paragraph A something of value to which a person is not entitled and obtains by making a claim under paragraph A something of value to which a person is not entitled. Fraudulent claim of affiliation with a federally recognized tribe is a Class C crime. This bill creates the crime of fraudulent claim of affiliation with a federally recognized tribe for when a person knowingly claims falsely to be affiliated with a federally recognized tribe with the intent to obtain and does obtain something of value to which the person is not entitled. And this is something that just goes back to selling. And if you're selling something, then you have to sell it under all US government laws and parameters. To look at this is basically we have people who are not tribal people, but like to dress up like that, like to dress up like how they think tribal people look, and go to schools, go to libraries, and market themselves as descendants. Uh, and now a descendant is not a tribal member. So, but they, they say they're descendants. They, uh, I'm, I'm, they'll say like, I'm Abenaki descendant, I'm Cherokee descendant, or whatever it may be. And those particular sort of excuses, um, go they, when they go there, they make money. They absolutely make money. And uh, they're charging a fee, three, four hundred dollars to go into a school for the day to do a show and tell. And so they are making money off fraudulently claiming who they are. They're selling themselves as, as something they're not. Also, you have objects like drums that are Native American drums, um, pipes, or whatever, whatever they may be, any kind of Native American crafts. There's a federal law which bars people from selling Native American crafts if they are not Native American because they're misrepresented in themselves in the market because the person who's buying something from the other side thinks they're buying something that they're really not. So uh, this is there's a federal law for that and it was not, if, if, uh, not really managed in Maine because Maine doesn't conclude itself with federal law on Indian law. So anything that has to do with Indian law federally if the state of Maine doesn't recognize it, then it doesn't apply. So Maine's the only state that's like that. So we have to go look for separate laws. So this law is that we're looking at here is basically the federal law brought to Maine. And why do we do this? Okay, and here are four people um, out of many that misrepresent themselves. So there's this guy up in this left-hand corner who this is actually a mug shot. Uh, claims that he was arrested because he was native and he was smoking pot or something because you know obviously native people smoke pot a lot you know uh, apparently and um, you know he was doing something ridiculous and not even native not even a Native American but claiming he was using that as an excuse and the guy on your right hand side at the top he is uh, not a native person, but he's actually marketed himself in several arenas and been in a few documentaries, uh, just basically dressing up like this, shaving his head and dressing up and and uh, 
you know, silver all over him and wampum shells and blankets and, you know, guns and pipes and different things wampum, you know, but absolutely not native but definitely and still is marketing himself in Maine as a native person. So uh, the only way he can be stopped is if, if uh, somebody reports him that you know he made money by doing something and misrepresenting himself. So he's not native, but he, he, he's playing Indian. He's dressing up like that. The left-hand side lower picture with the, the minister or priest, I can't quite tell. I think he's a priest. But um, there are two people standing there next to him. Again, uh, dyed hair, like so black that you know, I don't even know how, if, if, if such a black exists like that. But obviously it does because it's in her hair. And uh, deer skin and all these things hanging from her belt. And, and this guy, too. These two actually... Uh, market themselves it's their primary way of living they market themselves they make objects they put them on ebay they sell them uh, they go to schools uh, they even have a village in in maine somewhere that they they refer to it as a reenactment village so uh, they built this village and they were hoping to make they're hoping to make it into a, a museum like a living history sort of like a plymouth plantation um, these two uh, have been hugely targeted by the tribes because they're actually getting donations from the state, from federal agencies, under false circumstances, saying that they're native people, uh, you know, that they're doing this because they love their heritage. Uh, they're, you know, they really want this to be something that uh, a lot of kids can learn from. Unfortunately, the kids will be learning from false pretenses um, and again th these these two are dressing up and they're playing Indian <clears throat> then the guy on the right hand side on the bottom who looks like he got electrocuted uh, or is choking on some maybe gigantic fireball or I don't know or, or he's singing <laughs> uh, sorry uh, he he's um, another. This is he's part of a drum group uh, that goes around and markets themselves as uh, some tribe that no one's ever heard of from Maine. But again, not native, dressing up. Of course, if you're native, you have to have a bear claw necklace. You have to. I mean, who doesn't? And apparently, you have to wear a head brooch and shave your head bald. Uh, I don't understand that shaving your head bald thing. I really don't. It's not something we did. We, our hair was our strength, so it's just it's it's odd. Um, but these these are main citizens right here that you're looking at on this slide, who actually make money playing Indian. And now, because of this law that was put in place a couple of years ago, the people on the lower left hand side have actually had to take their website down. Um, and, and stop asking for donations because, again, they were doing it under false pretenses. And they all changed their names. They all changed their names to, like, you know, pissing in the wind or running water or, you know, one who blows hot air. Or, I don't know. I'm just making that up. But they always think you got to have names like that. You can't have, like, a normal name. But uh, these are all fakers. So the biggest point of this slide is evaluate your resources and people are resources as well and uh, they all go around to schools they all go around to libraries they try to get themselves involved in documentaries um, because they really want to earn money this way they want to make money and I don't know what they do for a living but I can tell you I know two of them personally and what they do for a living is nothing they just try to make money on dressing up playing Indian so here's our conclusion. Last slide. Imposed illnesses have a, had a deviating impact. Supposed to be devastating. I did really, really poorly with my typing this time. Uh, have a, you know, had a devastating uh, impact on tribes. 
Also, Native gangs are destructive forces within Native American communities. Uh, they're, they're not beneficial to Native communities at all. They don't bring good. They don't bring, uh, you know, economic development. They don't bring anything that makes their children proud. They're destructive. So, posers be posing, be aware. And uh, as we worked with, I worked with um, gang members. Gang members are basically posers, posing as something else, posing as the poser. Who's posing as a poser? It just keeps going and going and going. And I'm not trying to sound cool and hip, although I think I really do right now. But you know, this is <laughs> this is the uh, the whole idea. So evaluate your resources is the last one, and that ends up with what we just talked about. Written, film, and people are all resources. So use your resources. Like if you want to use these guys in a school, bring them in and show the kids. Like introduce them. Say these. This is an absolute fake Indian. This is a, a guy playing Indian. This is not what you ever want to do. You never want to wear a, a costume like this at Halloween. You know, and then and then go from there. You know, surprise the guy or gal, because there's many more out there. Believe me, I just couldn't find enough pictures as quick as I needed to and obviously couldn't spell a couple words correctly but um, they're all over the place so beware just evaluate resources understand there are good resources and bad resources that we put in front of our children and our learners and even us as, as learners as students we see things that are good and bad and we just need to learn how to judge them we have to learn how to evaluate those resources so that's today's lesson Thank you for listening, and I'll be back next week. Just check for your assignments, and we'll go from there. Thank you.